Welcome to everyone on Facebook Live as well and YouTube and of course our Zoom followers. Okay, I hope you all had an amazing, beautiful, delicious and enjoyable Passover break. Friends, Pesach is over. The cleaning, getting rid of all the chametz, all the leaven in our homes has gone. We went free wherever you are celebrating, whether you're in Israel, whether you are somewhere around the world, makes no difference. Pesach is Pesach. Chametz, that's Chametz. And Matzah is Matzah. We had our fill of Matzah over those days. And of course, we reintroduced Chametz back into our lives the moment Pesach finished, because who can live without pizza, of course, and a good holy bagel. And so it kind of comes to an end and there's like a little bit of a fizzle that comes with the end of Pesach. And we all kind of feel, wow, that was intense. There was a lot going on with this whole Pesach reality, chametz, matzah, sedarim, leaning cups of wine, trips with friends, family and loved ones, hopefully, depends where you were. And then you're kind of like, well, what now? What's the point of all that? Why did we go through that whole process? And we're going to have to see today, my friends, something so important. And I'm going to just summarize it with one statement, and we're going to double click on this statement and try to figure out a little bit more. And that is, freedom is good. Freedom is great. We love freedom because no one, no one wants to be a slave. Well, almost no one. Because when it comes to freedom, it's only good when you have a good alternative. Because freedom in and of itself is a good thing. But if you don't have a good alternative, something else to replace it with, you're gonna go back to square one or possibly even back to somewhere worse than square one. Let me explain. There was a movie, I may be dating myself when I say this, but there was a movie which was very, very popular when I was growing up. And I assume most of you have watched it. If you haven't seen this film, don't worry about it. I'll describe for you the key choice parts for the purposes of this analogy. The movie was called The Shawshank Redemption. And in short, it was about an innocent individual who ended up being put into a, shall we say, compromised situation of being in prison for a crime he did not commit. And the people who ran the prison from the governor all the way down were evil, terrible people who were taking full advantage of everyone in the prison. And there were various characters who were in prison during this time. One of them was played fantastically by Morgan Freeman. You've all heard his voice, I'm sure, on many other occasions, if not in that movie. And his character had been in prison for a long time. There came a point in the movie where Morgan Freeman gets to go free. And he'd been in prison for a long, long time. He'd spent, I think if I remember correctly, most of his life behind bars in a prison situation. He eventually goes free and he goes out there into the world. And you see him adjusting or trying to adjust to life outside the prison. And it becomes extremely difficult. And you see him at one point, I don't want to ruin the movie, but contemplating suicide during this transition from prison to freedom. I won't ruin the movie, but he doesn't kill himself during this episode. But truth be told, many, many people have. And not only that, there's a very strange scenario, situation that reappears again and again and again. And it goes like this. You have people who are in prison and they're in for a long time. I'm talking people who are there for 10, 15, 20, even 30 years. They get released 
and they find ways to become criminals again, in many circumstances, that's all they know. Prison didn't rehabilitate them, it just contained them. Maybe they learn how to be real criminals while being in prison, surrounded by prisoners. That's another discussion, not for now. But what's fascinating is that many of these people go out into the real world and end up reoffending subconsciously, say psychologists, in order to go back to prison. How could that be? Why would any person in their right mind want to go back to prison? They've spent years, maybe decades there. All they've wanted to do is get out. And then they reoffend to get back in. Why is that? What is behind this? And we can ask a similar question in a similar scenario. We all know stories, whether you've read or known people, who live in very bad family situations. Or we'll take an example. Let's say the abused wife goes through, and I've met many such people and counseled them, many years, even decades. I was speaking to a woman very um, recently who went through decades of emotional and sometimes physical abuse. And believe me, the emotional abuse can be worse than the physical abuse as well. And I speak with them or they speak to medical or social work professionals or therapists and they persuade them, you don't deserve to go through this. You can be free. And they manage to extricate them, get them out of being in these terrible, terrible, abusive relationships. And then after weeks or sometimes months, these same people will go back to their abusive partner. And you think to yourself, why? You were out. You were free. Why would you want to go back knowing full well what's there? And the answer to this question is, my friends, because freedom is all well and good. Being free of the Egyptians in Mitzrayim. Being free of the prison in the Shawshank Redemption. Being free of the abusive partner is also a good thing. But if you don't have something to replace it, if you don't have a goal, if you don't have a vision, freedom means nothing. And people want to go back to their servitude because there's something you have when you are a slave. And we spoke about this before many times. Slavery is horrible and it's painful and it's difficult and you have no freedom and you're told when to eat and what to eat and how long you can sleep for and so many challenges come with being a slave. But you know what? There is one thing you don't have, which may be worse for most people than slavery. And that's responsibility. Responsibility is tough. Because in prison, when you're a slave, even if you're abused in a situation, you know what's coming. You know what's expected of you. In prison, you get your three square meals and you're not responsible. You just go through life like a robot, just wandering through your existence. With freedom, my friends, comes responsibility. With freedom comes your decision to create a world for your own. So freedom is not an end in of itself. It's a means to an end. You know, we saw this in the past couple of decades with the Arab Spring, they called it. It's actually quite appropriate because Pesach, Passover, the Torah tells us, must appear in the springtime. The Torah says, B'chodesh Ha'aviv. And we adjust our lunar calendar to coincide with the solar calendar by adding an extra month every few years or so, an extra month of Adar, that's the last month of the year, to make sure that we push Pesach into springtime. Because Pesach is all about chirut, freedom. And springtime is about freedom as well. Agriculturally, we are being surrounded by crops and fruits and grains that are going free. And the weather is good for it. It's not cold like the winter we just came out of. It's not hot like the summer we're about to go into. It's the perfect time to go free. So you'll see, during the springtime, people feel the need, the desire to get out. We're all feeling it now after a long lockdown. Springtime is here. We can finally get out. There's something literally in the air at this time of year that speaks of and talks to us about freedom. That's why Pesach, Zman Cheroteinu, 
the time of our freedom must appear in the springtime because the season and the holiday and the experience are connected in a very deep, central and powerful way. But it's not enough. Look at the Arab Spring. We see many, many countries, many people who are able to take control of their lives and throw off the yoke of the tyrannical governments and dictators that were controlling them for years or decades. And suddenly they go free and the people find freedom and then they find themselves a new dictator to take over. Right? Nature abhors a vacuum and freedom is a vacuum. It's an empty space. It isn't something, it's nothing. It's the removal of the chains. It's the removal of the servitude, but it's not something in and of itself. And so we saw in the Middle East, many countries who very rightly were able to throw off their dictators, and then they elect another crazy dictator to take over. And you're like, Chacham, friends, are you crazy? You fought so hard to get rid of one dictator and you replaced it with another one because freedom is not easy. It's the same as the person who goes back to prison, same as the abused wife who goes back to that bad, abusive relationship. It seems crazy, but for them, it's not because freedom is not an easy thing to handle. You have to know what to do with it. The Hebrew word for freedom is chirut. Chirut is freedom. You know what, my friends? There's another word, which is the same letters, which spells the word charut. Charut. Charut literally means to etch, to cut into something, a message, an idea. There's different ways we convey items that we write. You can write on a Torah, for example, which leaves a embossed, <clears throat> risen piece of ink, but there's a better thing, and that is to cut into something. So charut means to cut into etch, to put a message that's going to last for a long time into stone. We see this with the Ten Commandments. You see, the Torah is ink written on top of parchment, but the Aseret Adir wrote the Ten Commandments were charut al haluchot. They were etched into the stone. stone. These Ten Commandments, which we'll discuss in future weeks as we get closer to Tisha what they weren't written, they were etched. There's something very integral about these ten that are cut into the stone. They had to be cut in in a more decisive, categorical way. That's what it was. So there's a connection which the mystics make over here. Charut means Cherut means freedom. Charut means to carve something on our hearts. Now we have a phase one and a phase two. You see, freedom only makes sense when the vacuum that is caused by you being free is filled up with something good, something healthy, nutritious, purposeful, meaningful. Just going free, it's not enough. We saw that already. Going free from Egypt is not enough. And that's why the Jewish people many times in the desert wanted to go back. And we saw in the movie, The Shawshank Redemption, going free was great. There's all these people wanted. They'll say to you, please set me free. But as soon as they go free, they want to go back. And it happens again and again and again. The abusive wife. Because freedom is not an end in of itself. It's a means to an end, my friends. So it is with us. The Jewish people got out of Pesach. We just left Pesach. We're free. The question is, now what? What am I going to do to take the amazing responsibility that was handed to us from this freedom first time thousands of years ago and now every single year? And we need to ask ourselves, so what am I going to do with it? Many people, all of us to some degree, were kept housed in lockdown in our homes. 
and we all said, oh, I can't wait to get out. I can't wait to be free one more time. Just get me out anywhere. I'll even take a Walmart. Just give me anything. Get me out of here. And then we get out. And the first question we ask ourselves is, now what? I mean, freedom's all well and good. But how are we going to use our time, our talents, our abilities, our genius for productive development of ourselves and other people? And that's the question that humanity has been asking for thousands of years. Freedom, my friends, is all well and good. What we do with it, that's the question. And the Torah has an amazing, genius recipe for this freedom that we take upon ourselves. And it goes like this. Yep, it's true. You're free now. But as soon as you go free, you immediately need to attach yourself to a cause. And the Torah does that deliberately and decisively. And it says Pesach is good. Pesach is great. But on the second day of Pesach, I'm talking, if you're in Israel, the first day of Cholomoed, for us, the Jewish people, the second night of Pesach, we do something very unusual. We start to count immediately. Day two pops up. For us in Chutzl Aretz, outside of Israel, the diaspora, we start to count. We start to count. Day one of the Omer. Day two of the Omer. Day three. What are you counting? How do you get involved in this whole Omer thing? We're trying to celebrate Pesach here. We just had the Pesach Seder last night. Right? We're enjoying ourselves. Having Cholam Moed. There's Pesach. There's trips. We're like, have a great time. Go free. Enjoy it. Don't work and hang out with family and friends and grandparents. Sit around the Pesach Seder table. Enjoy the rest. But it can't be an end. Because if you don't have your vision locked in to a future meaningful destination, it's not going to happen. And for us, it's Shavuot. Shavuot for us is our Harut al haluchot, the etching into the luchot. You must take the chirut, same letters, and make it charut. Chirut, freedom, must become charut. The Torah must be etched on your heart. And so as soon as we finish the Pesach Seder the next day, we don't mix the two up together because we're too busy with the mitzvah of Pesach. But as soon as we go free from Pesach, we make our way. And we start to travel and we start to count and we count up, not down. We say, this is day one of the Omer. This is day two of the Omer. This is day three of the Omer. Every day, a little bit more. And we start to build up a vision, a reality of who and what we want to become. You know, the Omer, as I mentioned last night, those who are following that last night's class, we mentioned how the Omer is actually an item. It's a food product, barley to be precise. Barley is the first crop that comes out of the ground. And this is the time when we start to harvest in the springtime all of our delicious fruits and all the effort that we put into our lives over the past year waiting for this moment. But barley, it's not a great food. It's just not on the same level as wheat. Wheat is what humans eat, right? Most bread stores around the world, most people are making bread out of wheat. That's the staple for the majority of the world population. Barley is an animal food. You see, when we left Egypt, we were barley people. That's where we bring that crop. We are people who are debased. That's why the Torah could not be given right after we left Egypt. Because although we were physically free, we weren't mentally free to receive the Torah at Mount Sinai. And therefore God spread things out he stretched them. He said, you can go free from Egypt. Now I need you to prepare yourselves 49 days in order to get yourselves into the Shavuot, into the Kabbalah to Torah, receiving of the Torah. We go from Bali and on Shavuot, on Matan Torah, a wheat offering. Shtelechem, two loaves of wheat were brought. That represents the animalistic side of us. When we left Egypt, we were raw uncultured, uncontrolled, 
until we get to Shavuot, 49 days later, where we are ready to receive the Torah. And so there is a very crucial lesson that the Torah and Hashem and the Rabbis are telling us. Freedom of Pesach is great, but it's nothing unless you have created a vision of what you want. That's true for us as individuals, but you know what it's also true for? It's also true for us as individuals. There are many times in our lives when we have wonderful occurrences, wonderful things happen to us, and we feel great about them. But then, you know what happens? Very, very quickly, we find ourselves in despair. We feel left empty and open. You've seen this with many people who go through retirement. You'll see these people will complain about how hard they work and they're working so hard. I've seen this so many times. I don't even think it's a bad thing. And these people will work their entire lives. One day I'll be able to retire and spend more time with my family. One time, one time I'll be able to retire and play more golf or whatever they do with their free time. And they retire. And they're like, this is horrible. I don't even know how to function as a free person. And many of these people, will go back to work in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Most times, not from necessity, or not from financial necessity, but from mental occupation. Just because you're free doesn't mean you're leading a productive and successful life. That is the truth for humanity. The key is, how do you prepare yourself for those times? By realizing that in the hard work, that in the challenge that comes through life, you can enjoy freedom at the same time. That's the key. Happens to be, and this is a talk in and of itself, that Shabbat is there to teach us once a week how to use our freedom. On Shabbat, we get to retire once a week. You get to retire and do no work, not even think about work, and just be present as free people. That's one of the reasons given for Shabbat. Zecher. One of the reasons we're given Shabbat is to remember that you were a slave in Egypt. What has Shabbat got to do with being a slave in Egypt? Because we were slaves in Egypt, says the Kuzari, but now we're free. But the Shabbat freedom isn't sitting around doing nothing the entire day or out playing golf. For us, freedom becomes a productive spiritual growth experience. And so I would say, if you want to prepare for retirement, a real retirement, keep Shabbat. Shabbat is a lifelong experience of preparing us for freedom. Because think about it, once a week for 25 hours, you are free. What do you do with that time? I know many people are like, oh, I can't stand this. When Shabbat over, I want to get on my phone. I want to smoke another cigarette. I want to get to work. I want to make phone calls. You're not free. You're not breaking Shabbat, but you're not free. Because freedom isn't just not doing something, it's filling that time with productive activities. So Shabbat is an exercise in using freedom for spiritual greatness. We have meals, we learn, we go to the Bet Knesset, we use our time well. I've seen it many times, many religious people who are able to retire and not have to go back to work out of non-necessity, use their time to do chesed, acts of kindness, start charitable organizations. I know many people who become teachers when they retire. They're using their time, they're using their talents and their greatness and their freedom to help other people and to give them the abilities that they need. This, my friends, is the secret to a free life. Not just removing the yoke from your shoulders, but finding a emotional, physical, spiritual outlet to channel them into. That's what we learn from Pesach leading right into Shavuot. I know there's a 49 day gap or more, but you're always counting. I have a vision, I'm free, but I got my eyes every day. I make a bracha, I bless and thank God that I can number and lead myself to my next destination, the ultimate destination, in that case, Matan Torah. And for us too, every Shabbat, we get to recalibrate. We realize that life isn't just work, isn't just sleep. Even if you enjoy your work and you should enjoy your work, in the end, it's still servitude. But what you're trying to do is create a world 
not of Chirut, but Charut. Chirut is free. Charut is, I'm going to etch into my heart a vision, something great that I can become. And so when the Jewish people left Egypt, you'll notice that they didn't just fly off to Israel and have an amazing time on Alal. What they did was get dumped in a desert. What a letdown. After all the miracles that we just spoke about at the Pesach Seder, all the plagues and the splitting of the sea and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart and then Pharaoh letting us go and all these crazy... And after that great spectacle of blood and frogs and wild animals and lice and hail and all this great stuff that happened to the Mitzri and we saw these miracles with our own eyes, we dumped in the desert. Why would that be? The answer, my friends, should be obvious. Desert represents a chance for spiritual growth. You're out in the desert. You're out in the plains. What are you going to do with your freedom? How are you going to change it? You've got to achieve it yourself. God can set you free. That's one thing. God can remove the tyranny from your back. That's a great and amazing, beautiful gift from God. But what you're left with is really, really scary. What are you going to do with it now? Now you're free. Are you going to use your time productively? Are you going to teach? Are you going to learn? Are you going to use your resource as well? Are you going to just sit around talking nonsense all day or playing golf 45 hours a day? I'm nothing wrong with playing golf. I, I play a lot of tennis, enjoying our lives as well, but that can't be the reason we retire. That can't be the purpose of moving from slavery into freedom. If you just do that, you're turning... Chirut, not into Charut. And that is the challenge of life. We want to become the Shabbat people. Pesach takes into Shabbat. Actually, the Torah itself refers to Pesach as Shabbat. You are told, just came to my mind, but it's true. You are told to start counting the Omer, Mi Shabbat, from the day after Shabbat. So Pesach is even called Shabbat. As if the Torah is telling us that Pesach's not enough. I know most people out there are going to celebrate Pesach and have no idea what Shavuot Matan Torah is. Pointless. Pointless. What is the point of going free if you aren't going to use your freedom for some great creation of a new reality of yourself, your family, your community? Doing something productive with your freedom is the greater challenge than freedom itself, my friends. And that is what we are going to have to figure out over the next six or seven weeks, seven weeks altogether, till we get to Shavuot. How are we going to learn and grow? This is the time to double down and figure out, I've got the whole Pesach thing, but how do I create a new life for myself? And there's no better time than now. Hashem, God, brings down a shafa, an abundance of opportunity to every single person at this time to create a new reality for themselves, their families, whether it's a, a new business, a new chesed, a new mitzvah. This is the time to, to grab that opportunity. You've got to take one idea of freedom and put something tangible on it. Take on a new mitzvah, a new hidor, a, a new personality trait that you want to work upon, this is the time to do it. The events that we're describing, the Pesach Seder happened then, but the responsibility of changing ourselves through this freedom, this is the time to do it. So let's recap. We said that freedom is a means to an end, but not an end of itself. And we saw many occasions where freedom doesn't lead to a good life, actually leads to more and worse hardship. The woman going back to the abuse's husband. The prisoner goes free going back to jail. These are what seem insane, but they make sense. Because if you don't have something good with your freedom, you're going to end up exactly where you were before, just maybe in a different location. What I like to call changing seats on the Titanic. You think you're actually making a change, but ultimately you're not. You're in for the same destruction you were in beforehand. 
Same concept over here, my friends. Pesach gives us an opportunity, but that's all it is. An opportunity to remove slavery and servitude for us. What we need to do right now is take that and channel it into a brand new and exciting lives of our own. That is what we're beginning. We're in it together, my dear friends. Every Tuesday and Wednesday, I'll hopefully be with you to prepare us for Matan Torah, to give us a vision for our freedom. Many other classes from my colleagues at Chazak. Wishing all an amazing, fantastic rest of the week and Shabbat. And may we all, God willing, be Zohar, merit to using the freedom, newly fried acquired freedom for great things in the future. Thank you all very, very much.